Wir ähm, haben jetzt die ambitionierte, ähm, das ambitionierte Vorhaben, durch drei weitere Kontinente zu gehen. Sie sind ja in Europa gestartet, im Grunde haben aber die ganze Welt eingeholt. Wir gehen weiter nach Asien, werden dann nach Afrika gehen und dann noch nach Lateinamerika ähm, und werden Erfahrungen hören, aber auch noch etwas stärker über ähm, Frauen- und Männerbilder sprechen. Ich darf Ihnen als nächsten Sprecher vorstellen, Pater Dr. Samuel Kanilang. Er ist Mitglied des Claretina-Ordens und von den Philippinen angereist. Seine Doktorarbeit hat er an der päpstlichen Universität von Salamanca zur Theologie des geweihten Lebens geschrieben. Sie gilt als Pionierarbeit für den Dialog zwischen orientaler und okzidentaler Spiritualität. Er arbeitet seit 2008 als Administrator und Finance Officer des Institute for Consecrated Life in Asia. Lieber Pater Semi, Sie haben uns Eindrücke von der Situation von Frauen in Kirchen und Gesellschaften Asiens mitgebracht. Wir freuen uns sehr auf Ihre Ausführungen. Ich komme, Frau Franken-Wendelsdorf, ich komme jetzt zu Ihnen und dann gehen wir nachher zu dritt gemeinsam aufs Podium. Aber erst hat Pater Semi das Wort. Wo ist er? Da ist er. Okay. Good morning. My contribution to our conversation will come mainly from my experience of journeying with Catholic women religious. I will begin by sharing with you certain experiences of women in ministry in Asia, which reflect their general situation in their local churches and in their respective societies, and how they creatively and courageously respond to ecclesial and social needs and challenges. The lives and ministries of women religious in Asia are conditioned by, first, the prevailing clerical hierarchical way of being church. Second, Christianity's being a religious minority in the continent. And third, the totalitarian or dictatorial oppressive forms of government in various Asian countries. Women religious in the Philippines are involved practically in all areas of life, health, education, family life, livelihood, Christian formation, human rights, safeguarding of children and vulnerable adults, promotion of justice, peace, and integrity of creation, and so on. Within the Philippine church, however, women religious feel treated like second-class citizens and source of cheap labor. They also experience avoidance and even rejection by the clergy. A common experience, especially among teaching congregations, is the unilateral and unjust taking away of their ages-long administration of diocesan and parish schools by bishops, usually upon the influence of jealous priests. It is in India where many religious congregations have numerically large communities. Indian women religious are major agents of pastoral and social services. A recent event in which they play the key role illustrates their social commitment and pastoral courage. In June this year, Sister Nirmalini Nazareth, president of the Conference of Religious in India, called on India's more than 130,000 Catholic religious women and men to join public protest against the increasing persecution of minorities under the country's pro-Hindu Bharatiya Janata Party government. In her letter to religious, she said, we can no longer remain ensconced in our comfort zones. 
our silence and our fear to play a prophetic role makes us complicit in the many crimes of today. Explaining the ongoing violence against Christians and other minorities in India, she referred to the ongoing targeted violence in Manipur, Northeast India, on Christians and tribal people. The continued attacks on church personnel and institutions across the nation. The migration of Muslims, mainstreaming of hate speech, and the plight of protesting women wrestlers. In response to her call, some 300 religious sisters gathered on a public road in Bangalore on June 5, holding placards declaring solidarity with a group of female wrestlers who accused their politically powerful federation chief of sexually abusing them. Women religious in India, however, have also become victims of abuse of authority, abuse of conscience, and sexual abuse in the church. When the communists took over the government of Vietnam, they confiscated the properties of the church, including religious convents, schools, hospitals, orphanages, and lands. The church and state relations have progressively improved since the Vatican initiated a process of dialogue with the Vietnamese government. Until now, however, the church has allowed a very minimal participation in the country's social life and human development programs and services. For example, religious are only allowed to run kindergarten schools. Vietnam is a male-dominated society where women are expected to be at the service of men. Similarly, the Vietnamese church is remarkably hierarchical clerical. Women religious are treated as assistants or helpers by the clergy. Nevertheless, women religious are growing in their understanding of the rightful place and responsibility in the life and mission of the church. The many young sisters formed and educated abroad, especially in the Philippines, play a significant role in renewing religious life in Vietnam. The church situation in China is the most challenging, the most irregular, and the most unstable in Asia. The provisional agreement between the Vatican and the communist government is generally experienced by Chinese Catholics as counterproductive. The church in China is in effect divided between the community which is registered, meaning under the Chinese Catholic Patriotic Association, and the community which is unregistered or underground, meaning not recognized by the Patriotic Association. Those who belong to the underground community understand themselves as loyal to the Pope. Underground religious women are often visited by Patriotic Association officials and by local police officers to remind them that since they do not exist in the eyes of the government, they possess no rights at all, not even basic human rights guaranteed by a normal civilized society. Despite their deplorable situation, underground women religious relentlessly and courageously continue serving the poorest of the poor. Like the abandoned elderly people in remote villages, and mentally challenged people who are at the same time suffering physical illnesses. Myanmar is under a communist dictatorial oppressive regime. Myanmar, despite the presence of courageous women leaders like Aung San Suu Kyi, is still a male-dominated society. The local church is largely hierarchical clerical. Religious sisters, especially those belonging to dioceses, are considered helpers of the diocesan clergy. Yet they themselves take many pastoral and social service initiatives, and given the extremely critical political situation of the country, they have to master a lot of ingenuity and courage to carry out their works. A picture that went viral in the social media of a lone religious sister defiantly facing heavily armed police and soldiers, pleading them not to hurt the civilian protesters, illustrates the faith and courage of Myanmar women religious. As Myanmar security forces crack down on street protests 
on February 28, 2021, in Mietkina, capital of Kachin State, Sister Ann Rosa Nutong, a member of the Sisters of St. Francis Xavier Congregation, knelt down before the security forces, pleading with them not to shoot the unarmed civilians. Just shoot me if you want to, she said, adding that the protesters have no weapons and they are just showing their desire peacefully. The Catholic Women's Council document observes that when women from across the globe speak of their experience of the church, the most common term used is frustration. Women are frustrated by the abuse of power, clericalism, discrimination, sexism, and fear they experience in church settings. To address the overwhelming clamor for co-equality and co-responsibility in all aspects of ecclesial life, there is a need to move from a hierarchical, authoritarian, clerical, and ordination-centered way of being church to a holarchical, egalitarian, and all ministerial church. The synodal process is a decisive and definitive initial step. This shift fundamentally requires, among others, a new ecclesiology and theology of ministry. We can envision the synodal church as a holarchy, from holos or holon, meaning whole, a church which is inclusive of the whole, circular rather than pyramidal, egalitarian rather than hierarchical. It is a community of co-equal missionary disciples. In this vision, what is fundamental and essential lies in the interrelationships of the members as co-equal partners in the life and mission of the church. It takes seriously the equal dignity of all members, men and women alike, rooted in baptism, through which all share in the priesthood, prophecy, and kingship of Christ. It is founded on the values of radical welcome, unity in diversity, mutuality, co-responsibility, and friendship. This vision emerges from the charismatic dimension of the church, that is the inner life of the church, the mystery of communion which is non-hierarchical. In fact, this is the church that Vatican II has envisioned, an undifferentiated pilgrim people journeying together without distinction towards the reign of God. Thank you.